Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice. I've become a total nerd over harsh vocals, and I've recently heard that Alex Terrible has some of the loudest harsh vocals live. That's crazy impressive, and it makes my nerd brain just real. So, knowing this, I want to take a listen to Slaughter to Prevail's newest release, enticingly titled Viking. Let's get to it. Oh my gosh, this is such an amazing blend of sounds. Immediately, not only are his vocals just such a cool blend of sounds, but I love hearing, there's like a, an element of folk metal that's coming into play, but really, really, really heavy. We've got, there was some sort of, uh, obviously some really cool drums in there. There was a bird. Um, there, it almost sounded like I had an extra uh, ethnic vocal just as I pause it. Let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> cool horn. <laughs> of course. Definitely, I'm hearing like some metallic elements as well. Almost sounds like somebody's sharpening a sword at times. Okay, we're gonna focus just in on his vocals now because there's some really interesting things going in there. But really cool initial atmosphere, and I think that this is a fantastic idea to marry these two things together. I'm gonna go back one more time and listen to those once more, but I'm pretty sure we've got at least a doubled track here. I'm not 100% positive, to be honest with you. A lot of times lead vocals and a clean singing track are gonna be doubled uh, or tripled. And with harsh vocals, I think it's very, very smart. I've heard a lot of different production where they add an extra track in there. And it's very cool. You get some extra layer of sounds. But the really, really cool thing about harsh vocals to me is the fact that you can have multiple sound sources. When I read about this, my mind was shattered. Hey, with clean singing, where I'm just making a note, right? A pitch. It's the true vocal folds. They go wacka, wacka, wacka at a, there's a very repetitive pattern that they have to do that at to create a pitch. And their particular structure makes it possible to do that at a regular speed so we get that, that pitch. Now, with other fleshy bits in our larynx, those are the things that create the harsh vocals. And there are multiple places where that sound can originate from. The structure of those fleshy bits is not the same as the two vocal folds, so we don't get pitch in the same way. Instead, we get sort of noise regions. And it's just so cool to me to think that multiple regions can go at the same time. That's like Amazing. We've seen that in a few other circumstances, which I'll talk about later in the video. Right now, I just want to go back and try to listen for how many different kinds of sounds are going on all at once. <laughs> Yes, 
заебись, а? Что ж? He's terrifying. I think I haven't gotten through 20 seconds of this and I'm like squirming inside of, whoa. <sighs> okay. <laughs> that is so intense. I'm, it's amazing how many words are going by at the same time as all the really cool sounds for creation. Uh, at first I was thinking we basically had Heilung plus some death metal essentially. And now I'm like, whoa. This is crazy intense. Okay, I'm gonna take a breath. I feel more prepared to analytically listen. The feels of wow were, were so enormous the first time. <laughs> I lied, I wasn't ready. It made me jump inside. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so we definitely have like a little bit of bouncing back and forth between different kinds of sound sources that are happening. Sometimes it sounds like he's got a lower one, sometimes a higher one, meaning lower constriction in the throat or higher constriction in the throat. When I say constriction in the throat, don't think that means that you should go and tighten everything up as much as you can. In order for there to be a sound, those fleshy bits have to get closer so that as the air is going past, they vibrate, right? So they should be vibrating against each other. It's the same thing that happens with your two vocal folds. But sometimes people will take constriction the wrong way and they'll think they're supposed to mega squeeze. And that area needs to be free to move. It needs to be engaged. But if you just squeeze it down, it gets locked in tight. So you have to find this crazy, very delicate balance. Delicate balance. You would think that wouldn't go together with harsh vocals, but it does. <laughs> that face. Okay, one more. I love it. That was a freaking awesome sound. That definitely felt like a scary Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was terrifying. I loved it. I love that in the background you have this like slidey thing that's going back and forth. It feels almost like an alarm that's happening. Let's go back to that sound. I'm pretty sure that sound is mostly coming through his nose. <laughs> Yeah, that's indeed the face that he makes when he's doing it too. I don't know, because obviously this is a music video, right? It might be that way, but you can see the pull of the nose up, mostly closed mouth, and that kind of pull will usually mean that you're sending more air actually through the nose, so the sound is escaping more through the nose. Um, very, it's very, very interesting, I think, how these sounds are so primal and they mimic uh, a lot of animal noises, but in truth, they're actually extremely complicated to make. <laughs> yeah, there's even, like, it almost sounds like he's got uh, the, oh shoot, he's, it sounds like he's almost got like some sort of vibrato or something that's vibrating at a slower pace in there that's creating an extra rumble. Yeah. It almost sounds like there's like a, a uvular R, like a kind of sound that you would use in a French R, for example. Uh, and considering what I've seen of different sound sources in the back of the throat, I think that's very possible, especially with the soft palate lowered, but I've never actually seen somebody do that before. I did suggest 
to Alex Terrible uh, last time that I featured one of his songs on this channel. I said, hey man, like I'd love to stick a camera down your throat. And uh, he was like, nah, we don't know each other that well. I'm still hoping someday, maybe someday, because if that is indeed using the uvula to essentially create a, a sort of break pattern between the sound sources that are lower than the uvula, that would be so cool. I've never seen something like that. <laughs> And you can hear exactly when that sort of extra thing that's in there that's rumbling, when it, it's rumbling at a slower rate, by the way, than the other stuff, because we can hear the space between it. You can hear exactly when it stops, when he shifts. Right, there it was. There's so much complication in there. <laughs> One more time. So you can actually hear moments where he's bringing a little bit of speech-like qualities in and even has some phonation that is from the true vocal folds. Anytime you hear something that's more like a pitch, that's bringing true vocal folds in. A lot of times when people are starting out on harsh vocals, we'll try to get them away from using their true vocal folds because the moment you start to use your true vocal folds in a way that you're trying to make the harsh sounds with your true vocal folds, that's when you get into trouble, right? They're, they're not designed to make these kinds of sounds. You have your false folds, sometimes called vestibular folds or ventricular folds. I know three names for the same thing. It drives me crazy too. And you have those, they can make some really great low kinds of sounds. And then up above, you have the area epiglottic folds that are up there. You have, in Will Ramos's throat camera, we saw these hilarious balls in his throat, essentially, which are the lingual tonsils. And they were involved in making the sound. There's also just a sort of narrowing of the pharynx that we saw that could help make some of the sound. And the epiglottis got very involved. There was spit rattle, right? And now it sounded like maybe some uvular, uh, action as well. I mean, there, that is just some of the sources. I'm sure there are, are many more. Uh, there's an arytenoid rattle, for example. There's, there's more. There are all these different things which are better for making noise-like sounds than your true vocal folds. Those are for pitch. Back. So did you hear like almost a little squeak in there at one point? I think that he had a little true folds action underneath the areas where he's making the harsh sounds. There especially. That part is so cool. We definitely have some true vocal folds in there and it almost sounds like he's adding elements of beatboxing to it. <laughs> gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, I love the different layers of the drumming and the way we are getting so many different uh, frequencies from it that are just, that's like enormous but widespread at the same time. It's just, that was really, really cool. <laughs> Wow. Oh, there's that sliding, almost alarm-like song that I was talking about earlier. Wow. Cool. So that's a really good example of what sounds like a very low 
sound source to me. I would say this is his false folds in here. And it, it just has a lower kind of rumble. If you're looking at the throat, and this, this is so fascinating to me again, I've become such a nerd over this. But if you're looking just at throat anatomy, your true folds are the lowest point. Then on top of that are your false vocal folds. They're actually fairly close together. Um, but in comparison, there's actually quite a large distance between the false folds then and some of those other structures I mentioned earlier that can contribute to more sound. So when people are finding different areas to create these sound sources from, a lot of times the false vocal folds will feel like they are just a lower constriction. Again, constriction like engagement, but not squeezing. Oh, that was a beautiful example of some more pitch interwoven and in the the, the um, spoken part interwoven too. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> hmm. I started getting some more lyrics in there. I know that some of this is in Russian, some of it I think is in English. And fact of the matter is that doing harsh vocals and producing lots of different kinds of sounds and enunciating lyrics really well work against each other. There are so many different sound shapes in harsh vocals which require your tongue to move in kind of a really strange way or your mouth to elongate because when we think about pitches, we're not making that with your true vocal folds, right? So you're making, you're shifting the pitch sound or really the quality of it is shifted in this space where you also need to be enunciating speech. So it becomes extremely difficult, say if you're trying to make a goblin sound, to enunciate particular words. Or if you're trying to do a tunnel scream, uh, like there are certain settings for your tongue to create a sound. So how do you also make words happen? It's difficult and a delicate balance. I think it's much harder for me still to get words when I'm thinking to harsh, thinking about harsh vocals than clean vocals, depending on the vocalist. Um, but it was interesting, I've seen him sort of weaving in some of the lyrics with a little more true fold engagement. And I think that's kind of a cool way actually to bring in a few more clear lyrics into the song and gives a little bit more story. I wanna go back and see if I can catch some more of that. <laughs> I think I got I am from the same flesh in there in particular. It's very poetic, I gotta say. It's really fun to listen to and, and um, really dive into the lore that is created around some of this. I, I just have to say I had such a different view of this kind of music even a few years ago. And now I am fascinated by it. I appreciate it. I don't listen to it every day. It tends to be just a little more aggressive than I feel like being in my, my daily life. I, I think I like stuff that sort of soothes and calms me down. But some people are soothed and calmed by this. It helps sort of like let out an inner beast. I get that. I think that's smart. I just, I find it fascinating. And I find it very energizing. So let's, uh, let's go back a little bit more. <laughs> a 
Okay, let's talk about how he's able to be so loud. You can't actually tell from a studio recording how loud a person is, just straight up. You can't tell that. Uh, there are different ways you can make their voice louder or softer. Mic position is huge. You only can really know how loud somebody is if you're live. And it's amazing how many people others will think are super, super loud and you get next to them and you're like, oh no, they're actually, they're not so loud. Opera singers, if they're a very, very well-known opera singer, they tend to be louder because they have to project to 4,000 people over an orchestra without a microphone. Uh, but even then, I've been surprised by how many super, super famous opera singers are actually just famous because they have excellent resonance to help them carry over an orchestra. They're not actually that much louder. In his case, knowing that he is enormously loud with harsh vocals. I'm watching for a few things. Like how does a person become super, super loud? And the thing that affects volume the most with clean singing, we know, is going to be breath pressure. So the pressure that builds up underneath the larynx. If you have more, you will have those chords come together, whack a whack a whack a harder, you'll have a louder sound. Now that can be dangerous because that can also cause somebody to do more vocal damage. You have to have a lot of endurance built up. You have to have a good support system so that the air isn't just smacking. So you have to build up some really good breath support. I've been watching what it looks like he's doing on stage. He is grounded. His feet are often very separate. So it looks like he's almost just shifting his entire lower body. So it's feeling like it's in the stage. His support is extremely low. And that's one of the ways that we have good breath control. It's one of the ways that you can help build up more breath pressure without just collapsing it and hitting your larynx. So I'm gonna go back a little bit. Let's take a look, watch his positions on stage and notice especially how his feet are positioned. There you go. Spread or with a foot forward. Okay, so you see now there tends to be a situation where their legs are either in this sort of horse stance as Bruce Dickinson does it or where there is one that's put forward on a monitor usually. And both situations help to ground further into the stage. With the leg forward on the monitor, I personally love doing something like that or just even bringing a knee up because it helps my pelvic tilt to shift and allows the breath to go even, even deeper. Your lowest breath support muscles are in your pelvic floor. I know, crazy, crazy, right? But if you can support your breath from that low, then there's a better chance that you'll learn how to sing with better pressure here for more volume. Um, this is also a very complicated subject because there's so many ways you can use that breath and so many other aspects to it, but that is one of them that could potentially help Alex to be a little bit louder. Let's keep going. <laughs> That's such a cool sound. That sounds like his nose is, is doing a lot of work. Well that the sound is exiting through his nose now. <laughs> so there was a definite uh, progression of low pitch center up to high there. Sometimes people will call that, um, like they're going from false chords up to a fry. I'm very hesitant to use the word fry because that could connect it to uh, two other definitions of vocal fry which exist in vocal pedagogy. So I like to refer to it as lower constriction or higher constriction, but we definitely heard that progression of lows up to highs, which just show that he's using so many different possibilities of sound sources to create this sound. <laughs> That progression was awesome. Wow. 
Oh my gosh. I love the way this part makes me want to headbang. And I love the way it feels like I'm like reeling in it, that I'm getting dizzy in it, just thrashing around in it. it the overall effect is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I just stopped it on a, a wall of death that's happening that always <laughs> scares me. <laughs> I know it's normal for a lot of y'all, but oh man, I just, I will see it happen. I worry so much for people's safety. Um, <laughs> I know I've been told by people who participated in it, they may get some bruises, but there's usually no serious damage. And from my experience at metal festivals, which is small, but I've been to some now. So um, I found that metal heads tend to be very fluffy, very nice people. Um, also, Alex is all smiley when he's not on stage with greeting with people. It's like, you can tell, like, he seems like a pretty nice person, especially when he sings SpongeBob SquarePants in a lime green uh, car. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm gonna go back a little bit because <laughs> I lost my track of that once that wall of death happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, okay, so if you guys are trying to copy what he's doing, I just caution you to be really careful about not engaging your true folds to try and make the harsh sounds. He's mixing these together because he has so much experience and he can do this without destroying his voice. Um, but for a lot of people I've seen starting off, mixing those two together at the beginning is not such a great idea. This is more of an advanced kind of technique. Let's go back one more time and then keep going. Look at that smile. Oh my gosh. Oh, definitely have some insane vocal layering that just happened in there, but I, I got a shout out to Rhythm. I'm, I love the way we have combinations of huge spaces between beats and then just a blast of beats in our face. <laughs> oh my gosh. I love the way there was this really intense section with so much music happening. And I was planning to pause right after that, but then somehow the intensity increased by having less music and more lyrics and the, just sort of magnifying uh, just Alex's voice. I, I've had shivers for a very long time at this point. Let's go back a little bit. Whew. Man, I'm so curious, like it's just so curious how much of this is a combination of sources and how much of it is a combination of source and mouth shape. Because sometimes people can shape their mouths in such a way that it almost sounds like 
they have a low, but they're using actually a fry scream or essentially high constriction, but they've shaped their mouth to enhance the low frequencies of it. And I hear so many different kinds of sounds happening that I, I'm thinking, are you using, obviously there are times when he's using true folds and I think false folds. And then there are times when I think he's had true folds and, and just upper constriction as well. But, you know, do, are there times when he's using false folds and area epiglottic folds and spit rattle and maybe some true folds as well? That is extremely, extremely hard to know even with a camera down the throat. So we could put a camera down his throat if he ever allowed it. And we could see from the top down what is happening. But if stuff is constricted on the top, then you can't actually really see much of what's going on beneath. Uh, luckily with things like tube and throat singing, which is one of the other things where we'll see a combination of true vocal folds and false vocal folds, both going at the same time. They're at a different rate from each other. Um, and the false vocal folds are just exactly in half if we're talking about the lower kind of subharmonics. So that allows us to see both of them going on when the false vocal folds are open. That's how we know that they're both happening. Um, but there are other things like MRIs that you can use to get some sort of uh, picture or video of it happening. But additionally, sometimes, I know this sounds scary, but sometimes they're actually little tiny needles that you can put in and don't hurt, might feel a little weird, but don't, don't hurt. They're not going to damage a singer. Uh, and that way you can know about muscle activation. But if you tell a singer, Hey, I want to put needles in your throat. That's like next level up. So ultimately it comes down to not only is it hard to get funding for research to look down people's throats for harsh vocals that, you know, most research wants to go towards a medical cause. Um, it's also just really hard to persuade anybody to let them let you put needles in their throat to see down to that other extra level. It's like, this is hard scientific data to obtain. And I wish there was so much more. Okay, we're gonna go back. <laughs> Let's see, here-ish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my gosh, that rhythmic shift is insane. Um, I just adore, again, this shift in intensity and that actually when we're getting more intense, it's like we have bursts of silence between or more space that it just has so much buildup the incredible sound layers and his sounds are just amazing and spine tingling <laughs> He sounds like a boss monster right there. This is fascinating. Sorry. Also, I'm so fascinated by how he uses his body to support his sound. I'm watching like crazy for how he is so loud. If I can just see it physically. <laughs> One of the really fun research papers I read talked about using spine stabilization to support harsh vocals in particular or primal sounds that animals make as well. And it was drawing some conclusions between that. Some uh, really, that was a fun paper. Go, go look it up if you feel like reading some about harsh vocal research. You can be a nerd, nerd like me. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> I 
I don't know why harsh vocals make me giggle so much, um, but I think it's because I get a little like, scared and terrified and then I get a little nervous about being scared on camera and then I giggle. I don't even know. It's some sort of weird reaction and it's amazing and incredible. Um, if you guys want to see me giggle endlessly at harsh vocals, I'm going to put together a playlist over here. Oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I'm doing this for you. It's just... <laughs> Why do I giggle with harsh vocals? I don't know, it's amazing. But I hope that you, like me, continue to fall more in love with music every day.